M&A is a profession. It's a subset of corporate finance, an actual curriculum, really boring as hell if you don't care about finance, and usually something entrepreneurs don't go into. So you're learning a dimension of it that fits a segment of the market. And this is marketing agency or marketing M&A. Welcome back to another episode of The Scaling Fast Lane. I'm your host, Valerie Booth. Joining us today is M&A trailblazer Peter Lang, who will share insider tips on finding diamonds in the rough to acquire, creating mutually beneficial deals, and seamlessly integrating merged agencies into your expanding portfolio. Peter strips the mystique from M&A, equipping you with the skills for acquiring and integrating agencies like a pro. Let's listen in. All right, so give some context quickly on this subject. M&A is a profession. It's a subset of corporate finance, what you're learning is today is something, and over these past few days, an actual curriculum, really boring as hell if you don't care about finance, and usually something entrepreneurs don't go into. So you're learning a dimension of it that fits a segment of the market. And this is marketing agency or marketing m &A. And to participate, we're going to say you need to know the right words, you need to know the players, you need to know the environment you're going to play in. The reason why in our sector, M&A is often considered as growth is because of something I alluded to yesterday. The media puts these big announcements on deals and we see a gap. We see a gap between a small business that is operating in a very you know, narrow market and the big players transacting. And we don't feel like that's us. Uh, you see these large holding companies in the billions of valuation, hundreds and hundreds of millions in revenue. They are elusive. They're off in the distance. And therefore, why would they ever teach how to grow and use their tactics? So in today's presentation, I'm going to give you as much industry updates, the status, the 2023, but I'm also going to give you things I need you to write down because when you go and interact in the marketplace with sellers, you evaluate your opportunities, this is that evidence, right? Yesterday was what's possible. Today is providing you with greater evidence to show you that you can do it. These big companies are very active, but when we looked at uh, 2022, it's very interesting. The uh, big players did what they normally do, which is almost a deal a month, about nine of us, WPP, and the rest kind of diminished. And the reason why they diminish is because at a certain point, they're so capital tight that they can win. Last year was a wonderful year where a lot of sellers went on the market after COVID and they got really hot, demand was frothy, and so were multiples. Well, that's changing, and I'll get into why. But how are these companies able to buy nine Seven, how are they able to buy this over and over again is because they have the steps. So the, the term programmatic in the agency world, especially the digital agency world, people say programmatic, they mean media buying, programmatic acquisitions. These are usually technology and acquisitions is acquiring customers. That's not the actual usage of the, the terms. That's just our sector's usage. The terms are programmatic means a program. You built a M&A program. And to build an M&A program, you need one person employed whose job is to do that job. Has anyone ever tried to run a program while they had four other responsibilities? Right? It's a challenge. So M&A is a full-time job. And you can get one person who owns it. And interestingly enough, because it's so seductive, when you do your first deal, you could probably do a deal with someone who can step out of operations and become that M&A person for you. So these are the steps. And we're gonna touch on this briefly at various stages of today, and I'm gonna recap it at the end, so don't worry if you don't get a photo of the slide or if I didn't unpack it all. But it's start finding, right, and integrate. This is a more, I would say, expanded version of the steps I gave you yesterday, right? Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the reality. This is US only. In US, we have 965,000 businesses cease to exist. 
That's 3,750 businesses closing a day. Couple on that, that 33 million small businesses exist in the United States, and that's 99% of all businesses. Right, so I showed you the big players, small 1%, 2% of the industry doing, but the vast majority of our industry and small businesses impact the greater economy. Baby boomers, they own 65% of small businesses. And that means, do some easy math, and that's close to 2.3 million businesses for sale a year come on the market or are continuing from previous years. So that's an aggregate. This is the disappointing piece of this. This is where uh, you have to take yourself out of your own business for a moment. That's 10 trillion in value over 10 years that if it's not purchased, it's not passed down, is going to dramatically impact the GDP and the stability of the US market. It's a next level of responsibility doing deals. It's not just to grow our own companies. We have to think a competitive ecosystem that exists with multiple markets globally and our responsibility to maintain the stability and strength of our economy. So you have a greater impact in M&A than just growing your own bottom line. So what does this mean for the future? Well, 50 million boomers will retire in the next 10 years. We call this the silver tsunami. Right? So as an economic term, when you look at baby boomers owning half of the privately held companies, right? so this is small businesses, privately held, aggregation of small businesses, 2.4 million business owners, one third of whom have passed 65 already, and by 2030, Jeff, right? Was that about when you hit it too, right? 2030, you'll be 65? 2030, yeah. 2030s, welcome to the last threshold of baby boomers becoming 65. And so these are individuals who, if they could choose, would prefer not to die at their desk. How many of you know someone in the industry, you're like, they're gonna die at their desk? <laughs> like, it's just, they're in it, they're ingrained, they're hustling. They are the forever bottleneck because they are the business and they love it. And their spouses won't let them come home. Right? They, they hide at the office. And I know many of these people who were built in this industry many, many decades who just thrive in it. 85% of businesses do not have a secession plan. The number one discount factor associated with small business risk. And they all are quietly closing. Has anyone had a neighborhood restaurant that's just closed down because the kids take it over from the parents? Have you seen that? Great community establishments that were just frequent and everyone loved it, but kids didn't want it. And they don't know how to build secession. They just know how to work really hard and run their business. Now, what's interesting is companies want to sell. It's not that people don't want to sell. 80% of businesses that list to sell, that's actively go online, never sell. So I think there's enough demand for everyone, right? From an acquisition perspective, everyone agrees? There's enough potential there? So what does that mean? Well, if buyers move fast in times of economic uncertainty, you have a higher rate of re invested return. So you have to position yourself to move very, very quickly when everyone else seems to be tightening up. When people seem to be uncertain about the future, you must be the one to act. You're ultimately evaluating market. Anyone else an economist here? Any other economist? So I'll unpack this briefly. Um, these are recessions, peak recessions. And you look at multiples that are uh, typically taken at a snapshot of time. And you can get this from PwC. They do industry annual reports on this, so please. Price. PwC, this is the 2020 state, this graphic, and then we've carried it off into what we're seeing now. It means you can buy people for lower multiples during economic downturns. Anyone want to take a guess why? What are we buying when we buy a company? Future cash flow expectation. So the, a transaction by terms is present value for future expectations, period. And so during economic times, because of the things you reference, people aren't able to articulate the future with a level of confidence that equates to higher value. The multiple with a break-even performance of a company, meaning you don't have year-over-year -year consistent growth, the multiple is the years it takes to break even. Simple math, one million in profit, at a 3x multiple is 3 million. But if you never earn more than 1 million a year, it's going to take me three years just to break even. How many people like to make an investment and just get your money back? 
This is where people get confused with multiples and valuations. This is where our industry has outs for a reason. Because I need you to increase the performance yield of the business I bought to decrease the amount of time for me to break even and then get my return. Any investors in here in other forms of stocks, real estate? Yeah. Do you, uh, investment return periods are usually bifurcated by industry types. Private equity, five, real estate technically longer. There's a variety of different uh, durations that are you know, typical for a sector. In buying of unsophisticated small to mid-sized enterprises, which I'll get, unpack that slightly in a bit, we need to break even as fast as possible because the uncertainty of a service business and owner involvement requires me to make money, my 2x, my 3x, my 5x return. When people sell businesses and they get really confident about their valuations, they just aren't helping you quantify our multiple of return. What is our job to do in a deal? Can I say anyone jump in on this? In a way that I can, a multiple of return. Not my break even. It's amazing that people go to market and say, this is my valuation purchase price and here's my multiple. And yet you're asking me to wait eight years for my, my return on a small business that was not even established with a consistent yield of eight years of past performance. Again, we have to understand what we're selling, we have to understand what we're buying. Okay, M&A activity was down. Oh, disappointing. But it's still at historic levels of high. <laughs> so when we look at the overall activity exists, uh, I had hinted that this type of market data is off of known transactions. The vast majority of the deals we don't know about, right? The mergers, the small deals between two companies, it doesn't feed into this market data. So it's skewed. But we're still at an all-time high. So when we look at values of businesses, this is from Biz Buy Sell, a great example of a website where companies list and never sell. You still see that small to mid-size, so SMBs, acquisitions are up. And you see sale prices dip. So the, this beautiful chart, and it's one of my best ones. Do you ever notice that the asking price is lower than the ultimate sale price? Always. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, right? That the vast majority of time, the number that people ask is not what they get. And the reason for that is they don't know how to quantify the multiple return for the buyer. If you did, you, that, number, that would be a little closer, right? So it's just, I'm asking for something, they're going to knock me down. And then you see all of these things that we use to create that uncertainty. The interest rates, market factors, and then we see a decrease in valuations as those interest rates fall. Right, so interest rates rise, valuations fall. And so the goal is to seek out transformative deals. Okay, Leapfrogging. Remember I said an easy button, faster than a speeding bullet, a fast forward, M&A does the things geometrically you cannot do organically. You have to be aggressive to leapfrog during the best time to be a buyer, the best time in a decade, a decade long we had an expanding market. It ended February 2020 and it ended because of a pandemic, not because of consumer behavior. It was unprecedented. It was the longest rising market we've ever experienced. And everybody thought money would continue to grow on trees, the wealth would be there, and valuations were frothy in 2019. I did two transactions at the end. That was Q, the end of Q3 and Q4 of 2019. And everybody was optimistic about the future. The reason why we see valuations falling is because optimism is down. It's very, very important to stow optimism's being down. We still see a lot of transactions. But you can always track transactions by brokers. So I always wait to give things away because I want people to take action on it. Uh, please ask Holly, and I'll give you a list of all of the industry brokers. Why? Because you go look at all of their websites or get your assistant to or someone who's a junior to you, gather their transaction data, and just start understanding it a bit. Right? You want to understand the market. Would you buy a house in a market you didn't look at? You didn't look at the school zone? You didn't look at the house comps? Right? You, you're going to participate in this. You got to understand what you're getting into. And they're the ones who are in it every single day. So just right along their wagon. Now, this is a, I mentioned, that 
hall I gave, where I talked about uh, instead of reducing, we're going to expand, we want to thrive. This is the slide I showed the company. And it's a tier one way of response to turbulence. And the response to turbulence goes from strengthening and growing to going out of business. And so along this uh, range, you need to understand where you want to be in your business because it's not going to get easier. No matter how you feel soft landing, recession, no recession, recession, however you feel about it, it just won't get easier over the next few years. So you have to stay the very strong position. Remember we said we're all here secretly in our staff and teams and people don't know, right? Maybe, right? We're learning to develop and bring to our company to strengthen it. You have to go back to them and say, our job during uncertainty, team, employees, that we are going to strengthen and grow and be in a tier one position in the marketplace consistently, and how we do it is twofold. We no longer fly with one engine on. Now, it's a very interesting reality. I didn't know this until I started speaking about this. Did you know you can fly a plane with one engine? Right? So imagine for a moment you're all returning home. You fly a plane in Austin, and they're like, well, just, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to inform you, we will part on time, but one of our engines is out. We can still fly, and we'll make it to the destination on time. Don't worry, sit back and relax. Do you think we would stay on the plane, even though it can fly with one engine? No, but all of you fly businesses with one engine if you don't have an M&A program contributing to its growth. It is for the big players, it is for everyone, and it is for Ava. I'm going to give away some things. These are new. I haven't touched on these in this content before. This is exactly Ava. So in the industry of investments, there's a term called arbitrage, right? Buy low, sell high. Buy low, sell high. There's various forms of arbitrage that you can use to generate returns on investment. And so the market is really interesting. Now, we focus on a category of the market where a lot of people don't want to get into. And it's because, why? You said this yesterday about your business. The, value, the time you spend on a big deal is not much different than a small deal. So why would we spend time on the small deal? Same thing with clients. The amount of work a small client is is the same amount of work a big client is. Why would we spend time on little clients, right? I just want big clients. They make their money. Let me give you a visual that's helpful to understand the, how these multiples work and the definitions for them. So Main Street businesses uh, is a form of small business, right? You think barbershop, service businesses, HVAC, right? Uh, and Main Street businesses is a unsophisticated small to mid-sized enterprise. And an unsophisticated small to mid-sized enterprise is different than a sophisticated, that word sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the things that are uh, deemed sophisticated. You have the ability to scale, like the book in front of you. You know how to do it. Redundancies and management. Meaning, if you're here, your business didn't stall while you're here because people can replace people who are out. And management means they manage it for the owner, not the owners. Management isn't ownership, technically. Management is actually a profession, just like M&A. Systems and process. If I can't have someone step into the role within your company and then be able to do that role if they're qualified within a period of time that's realistic, you do not have a process-oriented business. If it requires you to sit there and teach people three to four times in order to get the job done, it's not a process business. And therefore, it's hurting your overall value no matter your profitability. Because there's risks associated with un being unable to assign someone to take over a responsibility. You have people who've got family illnesses. The baby boomer generation are also parents to the people we employ. The vast majority of hospice issues are going to exist because we don't have a place for the people who are retiring and becoming ill. So that means the younger generation who you employ will have spend more time caring for their parents than any other generation in history. And they're going to choose their parents showing up on time in that client meeting and the things you need to do, as they should. But we need to make sure we have a system that allows them to take that time when it's needed. And that helps you improve your value. Um, national average of multiples for unsophisticated small to mid-sized enterprises, it's 2.8, profit. Why? Because that, why? 
eight, two, a little over two years, right? Or a little under three years to break even on buying a company. And growth is the whole nother piece of it. Also, the type of agency you have impacts it too. Right? There's more valuable industries, for example. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to run out of time. I'm giving you secrets, though. So, is it a good one? Very quick. Yeah, uh, EBITDA is bullshit, and SDE is also bullshit. Um, so, which bullshit number do you want to? Pick the one you want. It's profit. It's profit generating. If you add backs one-time expenses, that's a business. So, client revenue that comes in, removal of the owner's car, one-time expenses. Anyone who does EBITDA, EBITDA is a game. Uh, if you want to see it, the, the reason why Warren Buffett can do it two you know, transaction is because he looks at owner earnings, meaning the ownership of the company's earning potential off of the assets it has that generate revenue. You look at the management of that form of operating expenses, you just do a cleanup of it, but unsophisticated small to mid-sized enterprises do something that is not, by definition, unsophisticated. They minimize their tax obligation by running pass-through expenses. So those need to be cleaned up. But I don't get into, we use EBITDA, we have a full count department and finance department, we have all the pieces of it. But at the end of the day, it's a very simple napkin math. You say how much money comes in, how much does it cost to run that business, remove all the things that aren't required for the cost of running that business, and you can get to a, what we would call an EBITDA number. But again, keep it very simple. Right? Small, unsophisticated businesses, do not, you're not GAP compliant. <laughs> you are EBITDA consistently, you're not doing a trailing 12 constantly, or trailing 13 or forecasted 13 month financial review every month, right? Those are the things that don't exist. So it's not, I don't think it's fair to use those by definition, but it's, it's earnings, it's earnings. Well, Tom walked in, he's gonna say, Peter, I didn't know you added this to the deck. You're giving away our secrets. Please stop and he'll take my remote. <laughs> okay, so this is the model of how you do a holding company. It's called a portfolio of like kind and culturally aligned agencies. How you create like kind, we talked about similar languages and the words people use to describe their team, right? Like kind means there's complementary support systems and clients and you would potentially hire similar folks but just in a slightly different capacity. And so how you typically construct it is you take a group, we call them group, take a selection of agencies, you aggregate them under a single agency, you do not have to fully integrate, and then you have larger buyers who want them. And does anyone know why larger buyers want them? When you're hundreds and hundreds of millions in revenue, you gotta move the needle. <laughs> you can't move the needle organically. You do acquisitions to bump, 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 and consistently bump. You have to buy or else you stall. You have no option. Private equity, by definition, is the transference of someone else's ownership to the next one that needs to invest. It's just a moving of money in order for value to be created. Not much is different in the holding companies. Right? You got a certain size and scale. If they don't buy, it hurts shareholder value. So there's always buying. You just can aggregate. Now, I want to take a slight departure because I want to bring this actionable component. The biggest challenge is not deal making, is not sourcing. It's actually integrations. And integrations is called preliminary. I was going to prompt everybody, but the photos came out. <laughs> okay, integrations, all it means, you plan to do for the first 100 days, 90 days. And when you do due diligence, yes, you're confirming the representations made by a seller. But what you're really doing is starting to plan integrations. You don't wait till you close, right? It doesn't make sense. That was, you're going through look at all these pieces and then your job is to go, I see why you do that there. Oh, we're gonna be responsible for that thing over here. And so if you look at usually the first 30 days, you're not doing much. A lot of people think you have to migrate, transfer, do a, a lot of steps. Typically you observe, shadow, and document, okay? You watch them, because the worst thing you can ever do is to go into someone else's home and tell them how to raise their kids. But if you watch them for a period of time, like 30 days, you can sort of say, oh, that might not be, oh, be careful. If you cannot make recommendations until you observe, and due diligence is not observation. Due diligence is 
your confirmation of the things that were represented in regards to the purchase price. So that's why we break it out this way. Um, everyone got their photo? So, because I'm not going to unpack all of it. It's, it's a little much. Um, and I need to make sure you get the next level, which is strategic roll-ups. You classify, a roll-up by definition is uh, a company acquiring others. To grow. Well, that's kind of the simplistic way of thinking about it. And the building blocks and enablers that you have to have um, build a structure for focusing on your roll-up. So uh, we talked about you can acquire things you don't have, right? You can acquire things in the organization, the operating model. Like, who needs to build standard operating procedures within their agencies? Yeah, but if you merge with someone else or acquire someone else who already has those, then you have them just expand it to your service offering. You don't even have to figure it out and learn how to do it. Operating model is a very interesting one. Um, you look at people who run traction, uh, Vern's scaling up, 2i3x. Oftentimes, you could just acquire someone else who's already doing that program, that operating system, and then just apply it into, <coughs> as, a, as, as would a coach, uh, consult, outside consultant. Financial, oftentimes, uh, how many of you have a controller or a bookkeeper in your company? Okay. And then you use outside, keep it up if you use outside accountant to just support. Right. Great. How many of you do not have an internal finance person? And if you want one, they got one, right? So it's the other. Rather than you having to go figure that out, you can expand your station after a financial hole that you want to fill within the business. So this is how you start thinking of a role uh, in general terms. I'll touch on this. 30 seconds, agency types. Here's how they list in order of priority based on current demand in acquisitions. Brand engagement and demand gen, and then experiential. Those are the top right now. You go, what about AI? Bell curve people, bell curve. People don't need innovation in the early stages of the bell curve. What we need is more of that portion of the bell curve. The things have been tested and proven and done really well, and we need more because we're expanding it. And of course, all around the digital content and social. Uh, what are we typically looking for? Healthy margins and growth. Per the observation, it's break even if there's no growth, right? The multiple years it takes. So if there are healthy margins and there's growth, then I can compress time on my rate of return when buying a company. We look at the 2020 rule, 20%. EBITDA margins, and I go, I gave you SDE, EBIT, EBITDA, and then I said all of it's a bullshit, and this is very confusing. EBITDA is earnings before interest and taxes, because most of you aren't depreciating anything or amortizing much. <laughs> so this is just a shortened form of it. Uh, and the reason I just keep it up, I keep the vernacular, I keep it there, but just think profit, profit, profit. Don't get into the conversation until the accountants get involved with profit with people. Right? Just talk profit. And then as you get closer to transacting, you formalize the language. Uh, track record, very, very important. There's a great conversation about projects, businesses, and saying if I have a track record of success, things we've done with them as a part of the brand value that I'm selling, you need to have a documented track record of client success and production, and also ideally shared with the clients. I mean, the clients agree, they are aware of it, not just testimonial video. They agree, it's consistent, they participate it. And the other one that is important here is uh, we're looking to bolster functional capabilities. Okay. So we're looking for something we don't have. Like, how many of you know how to create viral videos about uh, pranking and get millions and millions of views on it? How about the rest of you? <laughs> right, so functional capabilities, how to generate viral videos is a function of that. Uh, you can grow and expand. Now, there's places you can go for this, so you're not just taking my words. As uh, Obviously, uh, there's a lot of sources. So biz equity, there's other tools you can pay for that monitor transactions and then distill that. Ava is, by definition, a private equity so we won't say that. We buy small businesses. We buy equities. Right? We buy assets. Um, we're trying to, of course, accomplish something as a greater mission in the agency category, in the sector. But the, the mechanics of how we operate means we need to be attuned to the industry itself, just like private equity is, right? not just the agency sector. 
Um, when we look at, there you go. Um, per the definition question, I was getting to it, but you beat me to it slightly. Uh, SDE and EBITDA. SDE is often used for small business. It's seller discretionary earnings. When you make money, it's at your discretion how you want to spend it. That's all that means. And therefore, when you're a fiduciary for your business, which by the way, all of you are, there, uh, people go, oh, they have a CEO title, they have three employees. Mm -hmm. CEO is a legal uh, role. An entity formation. Chief executive officer is a legal, established, recognized, required role within an entity. Whether it be one employee, no employees, you have to have that executive manager of a business, especially the ones that are corporations. EBITDA, of course, the bigger version of it, but we don't technically, in the businesses we acquire at this category, uh, give too much to it. Here's some just general principles. If it's less than a million in revenue, typically the profit is 1.6 times as, a, as an overall price. If it's greater than a million, then it starts to two. And the reason why I give you these numbers instead of the market numbers is that I already applied discount factors. I already applied the discount factor being an unsophisticated small to mid-sized enterprise. If you're at that size, you're probably an owner operator doing business development or involved in client services, you already have a lot of the things. Unnecessary business risk, you just have them embedded into it. But here's the one everyone likes, because <laughs> this goes to the point about growth. So how do you then move the multiple and what can you do to change that? Well, if you look at the top right, it says five years history of performance. People think growth one year, growth two years, make a growth company. <laughs> right? No, it's not. One to two years of good behavior is potentially the start of a good trend, but not one that you typically would in. So you we want to see this over a longer period of time. Four years preferred, five years is optimal. And we want to see consistency across it. If you see too fast of growth, it could be a signal of trend, right? It's not a part of the actual business. It's the market influence. Therefore, why would I pay for something that was a market influence that is outside of your control? You want to pay for growth you can control, not control fusion paid for it, unless it's assimilated. So this is a helpful guide. Okay, it's been around for a while. Um, higher multiples start kicking in around two million in profit. Or, or 10 million in revenue. Do you see how that's 20%? <laughs> so that percentage, right, comes back in. Here's some goal targets as a percentage of revenue. We want labor percent, overhead no more than 25%, and operating profit at 25%. And the reason why, let me be very clear, if you're above it, you go, why is that bad? We're better than what you have listed here. It means you don't know how to manage money. You said with too much money, it's not yielding anything for you. You have to invest capital to expand something, right? So if you're not running it optimally, you're not going to return on the cash you create. So you need to invest it. Now, if you don't know how to invest it, then that signals to a investor you potentially do not know how to run a sophisticated business. So that means I have to replace you with someone who can run a sophisticated business, reinvest capital that's generated from profits to accelerate the growth of the investment. That's where a lot of these what, replacements come in in businesses. Um, special cases for those type of numbers are aqua hires, meaning uh, Apple acquires a company a day, don't just announce it, and those are really aqua hires. They're going after talent or some piece of tech, and they just, you just can't hire. Like the, you just go find them, they already do it, you go buy them. That's as easy as it can be. So bankruptcy and solving, this is great. This is absolutely sometimes the best place to find a business. 900,000 businesses closed. And some of them closed because they can't sustain. They don't want to sustain. You can actually pick up things that are client serviced, locked in, uh, what would we call the insolvency market. Now, there's non financial drivers of valuation. Of course, not, not everything's just spreadsheets and numbers. Uh, Concentration is a big one called the Goldilocks rule. Uh, no matter how you do 
you're always in the bad. <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy. We'll find a way to make it something that's not good in the industry. It's hilarious. They'll go, uh, you know, 90% of your revenue comes from one client. So I brought on three others. Good. Your top three clients make up 90% of your revenue. Okay, I brought in five clients. 5% of your clients make up more than 80% of your revenue. It just continues to get away because until you expand client concentration outside of a significant impact of one or two departures, it is a you know, material risk to a business. Right? Um, so it's always this kind of interesting component. Uh, I'm going to move up the fourth one again. Solid secession plan. If close to above 80% of companies do not have a secession plan, obviously have a secession plan. <laughs> Where do you learn about a secession plan now? Phoenix is now in the room. So if you don't get it right, it's okay. What's it called? 2i3x, and what specifically in 2i3x is your secession plan? Your growth, lab growth lab team. Yes, the GLT team. The number one thing you can do, the number one thing you can do is the owner delegating the growth of a company to a team of people. Allow them to do it for at least two years. Two years, 2i3x. Oh, yeah, see how we have the, the logic baked into the name? Two years, the growth lab team shows of running the company increases your overall value because it de-risks the business. And that's the best part. Works for you. I just throw them up there because I want people to have that as an option. I ask quite frequently, what should I read? References that I suggest. There's a lot of books on M&A. I'm writing one at the moment. So there will be continuously a lot of books on M&A. Um, the, the important one, uh, Probably, it depends on where you're at. If you're not comfortable buying businesses, buy then build Walker's book is a good introduction to it. He'll make you go up. Oh. One company, just for a contrast, Walker's bought seven companies. I bought eight in the last two years. Various sizes and, and transaction types. So buying one company, buying three, what do I say? Get over five. So as soon as you buy over five, you could write a book. <laughs> Because that's kind of the threshold. Because you've experienced enough to where you can share the knowledge, and it's good knowledge after five deals. You will be good. You could share it. You could teach it. Um, I'm also a big fan from a conceptual perspective of strategy beyond the hockey stick. This is a uh, McKinsey published book about over a decade period of time the movement in the lower quartile of business performance to the upper quartile of business performance. Those that have a programmatic M&A engine. Programmatic and do programmatic M&A always beat the competition of the 10-year horizon. Always. Why? Because they fly with two planes. And any activity you do is practice, is, is, is about repetitions. So if you do one deal every four years, it's like traveling one time every four years. You're not going to be as good as it. If you, but if you flew once a month, becomes very easy. Flight travel becomes very easy. So these are the types of things that uh, you have to start consuming. Now, in my uh, former coaching and consulting life, I used to teach this principle uh, that has been advertised quite frequently as the ideal week. Has anyone ever heard of the ideal week? Okay, the ideal week is you sit down with a calendar and you say, how do I batch my time? the perfect week. If I had that week, every week it'd be the happiest week. I'd wake up energized to show up to work, interact with the world, and I would be fulfilled and entertained, and I'd feel like I'm creating value. And then you say, how much of that week needs to be dedicated to m and for me to my goal? So the ideal week allows you then to compartmentalize, allocate time and outcomes to create the things you want to focus on. So if you want more information about that, a part of our uh, mastermind and the days that we have here at the end, so tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, um, I'm going to pull up the ideal week example that we use for it. So I'll, I'll give an M&A calendar so you can see exactly what your job would look like if that was your ideal week. These are called strong moves. Strong moves. Okay? To achieve geometric growth, is not for the faint of heart, incremental. And you heard when Felix talked about the you know, lock in the goal setting theory. 
These things are meant for those who want to aggressively go after what it is they feel they don't have now or the ambition they want to achieve. Okay? It's the fastest way to grow, period. It's the fastest way to grow, period. There is no other way that you can find that will accelerate the current business size that you operate now than acquiring another company. I promise I'd come back to it. Okay. So we go from ideal targets, and we call it finding deals the right way. And the reason why these are late is because I was working with Scribe here in Austin to write a book. And 250 words a day, kind of, kind of a challenge. I don't, a lot of kudos to Jeff for his book. If you don't have it, he's got it. I'm to sign it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a task to write a book. So uh, Tucker Max, who was working with me on my books here in Austin, said, yeah, you suck, um, which is kind of my tone, brand for suck, uh, Tucker. Uh, he said, create a course, create curriculum, teach it to people, and we'll transcribe it and get the book out of you. So I ran for two sessions in 2021, 10 modules, teaching everything I knew. I had about 10 people per time I launched it, so just to make sure I had feedback and can answer people in real time. And then I extracted everything we know and we implement. This is how I got to know Felix. I was creating this at the time, and I said, these last uh, eight through 10 modules, uh, I really don't like doing the modules themselves, but the actual part of this. And this is what led to Tony Atkins uh, referring, which led to 2Y3X being the solution post deal to resolve some of these activities. Because the GL team becomes your integration team. Um, I'm going to be running out of time, and this is a dense version of a 28 hour. It was emotional to, to put this all out there and became the cornerstone of what we built in AVA. But this is how you think of uh, sourcing new deals. I'll be covering this in our, for those of you who stay with us after uh, the event or our boardroom event. Um, I'm, we're going to be unpacking how to identify specific businesses here uh, and then the steps you need to take to immediately potentially transact with them. For our uh, friends who are leaving who miss out on our Thursday and Friday today, Make sure to get this up after. Uh, some little more action bits, just to make sure you know the vernacular, you know the vocabulary, so we don't spot you. Right? So you feel like you're fitting in. A platform is essentially, um, Han would be considered like a platform. So Han is a brand, he's created a platform, he's done a few deals, he's done three deals, and he's now growing the brand, Han. So that would be considered a platform. And you would bolt on to that, and bolt on to be someone's probably something complimentary, but sizable. A tuck-in is someone that is assimilated into the P&L. The term can be used in different ways, but it's very important to know is when you do a tuck-in, it's very much like an aquifer. It should be contributed to one of the bolt-ons. It should be assimilated into the P&L. It should be a consideration of improvement and value add. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna end with this. Those are all the steps. That when you build a CRM pipeline, you just have columns in your pipeline to track the deal potential. And for those of you who do stick around and talk to Ayelet or Holly about uh, Thursday and Friday, the more intimate time with us, um, I give these type of documents to the team. Those who have joined us in the boardroom who are committed to doing this and getting additional support in our more one-on-one -on -one environment, one-on-one -on -one group setting, which is a weird way to say it, but it is a one-on-one -on -one group setting. Um, you get standard operating procedures that Tony can attest. These are the exact documents we use as standard operating and playbooks to communicate with folks. Uh, that thousands of agencies go through them now, both within our own capacity at Ava, Uhuru, and the people who've taken my course when I used to offer it independently. And these are the steps you can implement so you can feel more confident that you're repeating, you're creating a process for yourself to build that engine. And that includes my integration playbook, the items you'll learn, and feed you. It's important that you define and create your own M&A blueprint. You use what we teach to fit you, what your business is. Uh, but at the end of the day, I no longer offer this independently. This is now part of Scale at Speed. Scale at Speed is the marriage between M&A, which was my uh, you know, curriculum, 
and my teaching on this, and Scale at Speed, the book, and Tom's financial wizardry of building billion dollar brands and companies. And so part of this is now, as you join us, will be available to you in the portal that Holly's put together for everyone in our mastermind. I do not have time for questions, even though there's a slide. So <laughs> thank you. Oh, yeah. So this is, this is very important. So remember I asked you if you all wanted to hear the Ava pitch instead of what Tom was going to tell you? I'm like, yes, we'd like to hear the Ava pitch. So it's a strange thing. This is going to get very meta. The meta side of this is he's going to pitch you, but also hopefully you can extract how to build your own pitch while he's pitching you. Does that make sense? Yes. So you are all magicians watching another magician do a magic trick, and you see the sleight of hand. Okay. Okay, you can take the right notes. Additionally, he's going to set this down to fit the time we've given him and the time I'm taking at the moment, because you don't need the intros of who we are. <laughs> because you're here and you understand that bit. So he's going to jump uh, and skip a few pieces that we would normally include. He'll probably provide some context for that, just so you have it as instruction. And the reason why this is so important for everyone is this gives you an option to do something similar, understand how to build a pitch deck. Tom raised $100 million from two private equity firms with a deck. Thanks for listening to the Scaling Fastlane podcast. If you enjoyed this content and are looking for a more immersive experience, join us at the next Scale at Speed live event. It's packed with dynamic content, expert insights, and a room full of like-minded, action-oriented agency leaders. Come elevate your scaling journey in person. Visit scaleatspeedlive.com to ensure your spot today. We can't wait to see you there.